Wow, this is hot. <laughs> Last time I saw you guys was July 5th. And obviously there have been a few things have happened since then. Uh, Brother Ray alluded to it. I spent 11 days in Lexington Medical Center. Uh, went in with what we thought was just, <coughs> excuse me, a simple case of pneumonia. Within three hours after getting there, they had discovered my hemoglobin had dropped one half of what it should be from 13 to 6.8, which seemed to mean internal bleeding, which they have not located yet. And the hemoglobin has gone back up, so whatever it was, God's taken care of it. And anyway, what I, I, I was saying that to say this. There have been attacks on God's people. Brother Ray's been going through it. I know that uh, Donna and Marvin going through it. Brother Jerry's been going through it. Just everywhere you turn, I, I, I hear from Bones and Oz and the guys in Myrtle Beach. Everywhere you look, Satan is coming against God's people. And he's doing it because he's running scared. That's right. It's very simple. He knows his days are over. He knows it, and he just wants to bring as many down with him as he can. Thank God he's not bringing me down. Amen. You know, I probably, under the situation today, um, should be maybe... Um, preaching on Isaiah 53, 5. But I actually still have problems with that. Uh, two weeks ago this morning, I was laying in that hospital bed and just telling God, take me, I don't want to do this anymore. Connie's standing there slapping me upside the head saying, if you'll get to the point of where you were healed as opposed to your I am sick, you'll be a whole lot better. That's, it's easy for me to tell somebody else that. It's not real easy for me to, to grasp that when I'm the one that's got five IVs running in me and that kind of stuff. But it's okay. It's okay. I'm not even going to go to there this morning. There is a controversy in the church today. Um, this came up on Facebook. I think it was last night, maybe night before. Excuse me again. And a friend of mine asked a question, opened it up for full forum about continuously helping somebody when they know that that person may or may not be doing what they should be doing in stewardship for what they have. Am I helping them or am I enabling them? Am I helping them or am I enabling them? Well, if God had not enabled me when he knew I was doing wrong, I wouldn't be here. So I did a little research. And, you know, of all the times in the Bible, in the New Testament, that Jesus said to reach out to help to give, not once did he say, research the reason why. Not once. He said, find a need and fill it. Never did he say, um, well, don't enable that person. Never did he say, don't give to them because they're not doing right. Jesus loved the one not doing right just as much as he loved the one that was. He told the rich young ruler to sell everything that he had and give to the poor. Not find out which of the poor really needed it because they weren't throwing away their own money. He said to give it. <clears throat> and giving is controversial in today's church. In every aspect of giving, it's controversial in today's church. So what I want to do 
if I may, I, I, I want to basically just read scripture and we'll touch on some points in this. Uh, Going to be in the uh, King James there, Brother Ray. And Matthew chapter 6, beginning with the first verse. And this is Jesus speaking. Take heed that ye do, that ye do not your arms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. First of all, he expects you to be giving. He didn't say, if you give alms, he said, when you do. We're not under some new grace, some new thing in the New Testament where giving went away with the Old Testament. Jesus plainly expected us to give not only to the poor, not only to the church, but to the kingdom of God. Continuing, going to verse 2. Therein, when thou doest thine alms, and again, when thine doest them, not if, when thine doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. <laughs> you know, I, and I have been guilty of this in our Be Aware and Care ministry and in other ministries. I, I, I've been, a, been guilty. When we've been able to reach out and help somebody, I want to get pictures, or, you know, I want to get it out and show people. Uh, and, and I fooled myself a little bit by saying, well, if they see what we're doing, they'll help us do a little more. And the truth is, is I just wanted somebody to know, hey, I'm doing something good for somebody. Had nothing else to do with anything. If God ordains it, God's going to put the money into it to do it. I don't have to make a show of what we're doing. And, and no other ministry has to make a show of what they're doing in order for God to maintain a missions field through that ministry. I know the great mission work that goes on here at Freedom Life. You know, I'm just so proud to be a part of that. Uh, verse 3. And again, but when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. When thy doest alms, not if you do them. It is not up for conversation. Jesus very clearly expects his church to give alms to the poor. And that, of course, as we know, is one of the four biblical forms of giving. And it's the only form of giving, by the way, the alms is the only form of giving which does not go to God. It's the only one that goes from man to man. And you'll never lose a dime if you're, if you're giving alms because God said you're lending it to him and he will repay. So, yeah, it, it, it's not a, a matter of should we, it's a matter of when we. It's not a matter of do we enable or is it a matter of we find a need and we fill it? Is it a matter of we take great pride in what we've done? Or do we reach out and help somebody and don't tell anybody else what we've done? Because the word says what God sees you do <coughs> in secret, he will reward openly. We're not necessarily talking about materialistic things. We're not talking about a, a, a prosperity message, well, depending on your terminology of prosperity message. But we're talking about God's going to reward spiritually, physically, financially, in all three realms of God's work. And he is a three-dimensional God. Physical, financial, and spiritual. And he can reward in all three areas. Amen. 
And when thou prayest, thou shalt not as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Jesus going through this entire chapter, or the first verses of this chapter at least, is saying what we as Christians, as followers, as disciples of Jesus Christ should be doing, we should be doing out of love, we should be doing out of compassion, we should be doing out of the love that he has for us, and we should not be doing it just so other people can see how good we are. My, 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 my. I see so, so, so many standing up and we have done this and we, how many people watch TV and see it? We've spent $10 million putting one water well in Kenya. We've spent $10 million to put 1,000 water wells in Kenya. Now, in the pictures of the, I'm wondering, there's one little kid that's sick and, and hungry He's been there since I was a kid. And yeah, they keep feeding him, but he never seems to get any better. I wonder about these things. Why are you on television bragging of what you're doing and begging for somebody to help you when if you just do it, God's going to help you? That's right. I'm tired of it. Brother Ray, I'm tired of people playing God's game are playing games with God. Those last two weeks in that hospital had a profound effect on a lot of ways of my thinking, a lot of ways of my doing things. Um, a lot of you knew me just four weeks ago. 200 pounds, relatively strong, had some heart problems, but could do what I wanted to. This morning I had to have my wife help me get dressed. She has to help me get in and out of bed. I can't do it anymore. It's, what I was is gone, but you know what it's done? It's shown me that I'm still here, I'm still standing, and I'm still here for Jesus Christ, and it's okay for me to be dead as long as he lives through me. Amen. And I thank him so much for saving me and enabling me through the years when I was doing so wrong and never going, well, he had something that I gave him last week and he threw it away, so I'm not going to give it to him again this week. Oh, God loves me. God loves you. And he's going to enable you. He's not going to ask you why you're in the trouble you're in. Look through the Bible. Look, look through, through the New Testament. Can anybody anywhere tell me anywhere where Jesus asked somebody how to get in the shape you're in? I don't think so. I don't think ever did he ask he just saw a need and reached out and filled it. I'm not telling anybody to, to give money to our ministry. I don't need it. I don't want it. What we're going to do, God's going to take care of. Amen. As a matter of fact, and this is a little bit rough for me, we have got a fantastic program set up for the month of September with Debbie Wright Cook coming to do singing and worship with us. And that will be the last Ministry in Motion Taco Sunday. Um, at least the last planned. Because I don't know where my health's going to lead. Uh, I don't know whether I'm going to be able to continue. So as of right now, September will be the last. <coughs> We're working with Brother Bones to get Ministry of Motion 
started back up again at Myrtle Beach. I spoke with Bones this morning. Um, I know this is much of a Sunday school message and I'm rabbit tracking everywhere, but these things have went through my mind so much over the last two weeks and I have to share them. I, yeah. I looked up from a hospital bed and saw Pastor Ray and Sister Amy standing there. And I almost did not recognize them. I was so weak, I couldn't see. Marvin and Donna, I didn't even know they'd been there twice. Connie told me they were there, I didn't know it. Bob Dylan said it years and years ago, I'm not, not knocking on heaven's door, and two weeks ago I was. Right now I can thank God that he didn't open the door. <laughs> Left me on this side of the green for a little bit longer. But I'm going to tell you right now, I wanted to go. I wanted to go. Those streets of gold and those clear crystal streams sure sounded good. There'll be no sorrow and no pain. Sure sounded good. But apparently he has one more mission. One more thing for me to do. Amen. And guess what? He's going to enable me to do it. Yes. Controversy in giving in the church? I don't think so. All it takes is somebody to read the word. We're not giving to somebody when you put money into, if, if you you put an offering into Freedom Light, you're not putting money into Ray's pocket. Come on, preacher. You're putting money into the kingdom of God. Amen. When you help somebody on the street, you're not just putting a hamburger or a, or a sandwich in somebody's mouth. You're feeding Jesus. Come on, preacher. <laughs> I can't understand it. I can't understand how we, me, have wasted so many years misunderstanding the simplicity of Jesus' message. I've made so many mistakes. Made so many wrong turns. <coughs> Both in and out of the ministry. And he stood by me. And he's given to me. He's given me a wonderful wife. He's given me a little bit of health. Still left. And I believe that's going to get stronger again. But I don't know right now. He's given me a ministry online that is just beginning to show me what's going on. I've always wondered if I was just wasting my time on my Facebook page for the last five and a half years. And when I was in the hospital and since I've come back, the comments, the notifications, the private messages, text messages, phone calls. No, we're touching somebody. Amen. We're touching somebody with the good news of the salvation of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. I talked about giving today not to not to bring up the monetary or financial side of giving, but this giving. This given. Meeting a need is not necessarily enabling. People don't know or don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's right. And if you can't show somebody that you care, that you understand the love that Jesus Christ has for you, and are able to share that <coughs> with them. They don't care. They're not going to 
even understand that it's the love of Jesus. Unless you understand it first, and you're not going to understand it, unless you allow yourself to get filled with it. You have to be filled with His love. You have to be filled with His Spirit. And you have to go each and every day into His Word and understand more and more how to get away from the complication and go to the simplest. Churches for the last 2,000 years have been complicating the simplistic message of Jesus Christ. Got it to the point where you need a good theologian to help you misunderstand the Bible. <laughs> I just thank God that he has given me the ability to read it. The ability to ask him to explain it. And the ability to listen. I'm still here. I don't know what is what he has in store for me next. I really don't. But whatever it is, I look forward to it. I'm sorry it wasn't much of a message this morning. I love each and every one of you so very, very much. What a blessing it was to be asked by Ray to come again this, this morning. Uh, I really... Didn't even know it until Friday that I was coming. And like I said, I, I had something working on Isaiah 53 5. It was a great message, but God just put this on my heart last night. And I, I didn't have a chance to prepare it, I didn't have a chance to study for it. I just have to tell you what God told me. And that is, if He doesn't enable you, you ain't going to get through. And if you don't help somebody else, they're not going to get through. And I've said this a couple of times, and I'll end with this. It is possible to help without caring. It's impossible. says, let not your left hand know what your right hand doeth. Anybody know where we get a misunderstanding in the church with the scripture? People want to use this scripture to be unaccountable. Well, the Bible says don't let your left hand know what your right hand do. The Bible does say that. But that's not dealing with your tithe, that's dealing with your arms. And your tithe and your arm is two different things. Whenever they got prepared to, to select deacons and not to run the church but to serve the bread, there was a list of qualifications that they gave them. How do we know if people's faithful if there's no accountability? No, I mean, everybody wants to, the, 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 to well, well, I can't, I, I don't sign my envelopes and I'm not going to put my name on no envelope and I'm not going to, well, that's fine, that's between you and God, but if you're going to be accountable and if you're going to be a part of something, you need to be a part of something, hallelujah. Now, your arms is totally different. You don't need to be running around running your mouth about, and God's convicted me before. Well, Brother Ray, like I've said before. Oh, I'm not saying that you there, said there, there, are four, there are four separate offerings or givings that are biblical. Of course the tithe. First and foremost is the tithe. Then you have the seed offering. Then of course the alms 
and there is just the first fruit offering. So there are four different. I touched on just one. But first and foremost is tithe. And that is not an Old Testament law. That was given long before the law. So it was not done away with, as some people want to think that the law was done away with as we moved into the New Testament. Uh, the law was not done away with. Jesus said it's not going to do away with it. I can't do it. Fulfilled. So the law has been fulfilled, and we're still under the law. But we're under grace when we don't succeed in the law. Okay, sorry. Amen, that's good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anybody got any questions? Comments? I like what Brother Eddie B. says. Eddie B. says, and, and, and he's got a powerful ministry, travels all over America, singing and ministering in the prison system. He said, I want you to get on our team and support the prison system in America and winning souls. But if you're not tied, then we don't want your money. I, I about jumped out of my skin with you because you know evangelists don't talk like that. Because most evangelists, they want your money. <laughs> They need it. I mean, truth, truth, truth. If you're going to travel America, you need. You can't get from here to there in a van without some money. You can't. I mean, gas. He, he has to have money. But when he said that, that just something leaped in me because he he he, know, he understands that there's a principle. Because you can't truly give an offering. You can't truly give alms unless you give it God the first. So that's why it's been a part of our ministry ever since we started. We, we, we believe in teaching and giving. We live what we preach. But we need to be supporters of our churches. We need to be we need to be tithers. We need to be tithers, but not because the pastor said we need to be a tither. Not because the denomination says we need to be a tither. But because the Bible says that we need to be a tither. The Bible says in Malachi, now you get people don't like to hear the Bible sometimes. They want to hear that God loves them, but they don't want to hear the Bible. But yet, if they would take an honest evaluation, they would see the manifestation of the teachings of the Word in their lives. The Bible said that if you're not giving your tithe and your offerings, by the way, what's that mean? Okay, if God tells me to give John $5 and I sit on my bowels of compassion, I say, I'm not giving John that $5. Forget John. Well, I just brought a curse on my finances. The Bible says when you rob God in your tithes and your offering that you're cursed with a curse. But I believe that Jesus came to overcome the curse and there's no more curses. Well, that's all good and well, but what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? But well, they robbed God. That's in the New Testament. That's after Jesus had been crucified. That's after Jesus had been resurrected. That's after the Holy Ghost had been poured out. The church is being formed as a baby church and it's so important that they were judged. And we get judged too. I remember I was at church in Tennessee, man, the thing was tied. It was when the market fell out and I quit tithing to the conference for a little while. We quit sending our tithe for the church. I quit sending my personal tithe. I put it all in the church. I said, the church needs it. And man, thing got worse for the job. And I got out there praying, and God said, well, you better start back tithing. I said, yes, sir. So I'm not preaching out of something or teaching out of something that I haven't walked out, hadn't been dealt with myself. So God deals with me. And, but the one thing I wanted to point out in this scripture, this does not mean that you don't have to be accountable in your giving. This means you don't have to be accountable in what you do above your tithe. What you do above your tithe is between you and God, but you still need to do it because it still can bring a curse. You still can get in trouble. You can give your 10%, but if God tells you to bless your neighbor, you don't. To him who knows to do good, don't do it. To him it is. Anybody know what the next word is? Sin. Brother Ray. Yes, ma'am.
that's the Bible. That's what the Bible exactly. teaches. And there's a teaching exactly. somewhere, I believe it's in the New Testament, teaches exactly that. Whenever we talk about giving, I'm often reminded that Jesus, you know why we talk about the widow with her two minds? Because Jesus told it. He couldn't have told it if it wasn't accountable if he didn't know. And he still knows what we're giving and what we're keeping and what we're doing with what we have. And I'm a living testimony that it's easy to live off of. Well, we don't even live off of 90% anymore. I don't know where we're at. We're somewhere between 10 and 30% in our giving. Well, 15 and 30%. Somewhere between 15 and 30% me and my wife because we give to missions and we give to support a, outside of what we do in the church. We, right. we give to support other ministries and a kid in Africa and God just God just blesses us. It's, we, but the number one reason, what would you say the number one reason people would say that they don't give, Brother John? The number one reason people in the church. There's, there's two reasons and I think they both kind of run side by side and they don't understand either one. Uh, first reason that I hear more than anything else is I can't afford to. And second, I don't have to. I'm not under the law anymore. Amen. First, you can't afford not to. It's not the law, as we mentioned. It was given long before the law. Uh, and what does Malachi 3 and 5 say? You know, bring forth the decision be made to him. I shall open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing which you cannot contain. Which, And that part is great in itself. And that's a, the only part of the Bible where God ever said, prove me. That's the only part in the Bible where God said, do this and see if I won't do exactly what I say I'm going to do. But what I like is the next part. What I like is the next part. Where it says, I will re rebuke the devourer for your sake. Amen. If you're tithing, you ain't got to worry about wandering around here saying, Amen. Satan, get away from me. Ain't your job no more. God's taking care of it. So you can't afford not to do what God said. His economic system was set up long before man's economic system. And his economic system has worked throughout all these years where man's never has. Amen. So, my, that's the only way I can answer it. Well, John gave the great answer. That's what I was looking for because that's that number one answer right here is I can't afford to. And what you said is so true, we cannot afford not to. We can't afford to live under a curse. You know, there's the woman, because I remember I said, Lord, I'm teaching this teaching, and I need some scripture to back it up. Because I teach that everybody all the time. Some people think if you're in a certain economic state, then you don't have the time. But that's not the Bible. The Bible is the same for the rich, the poor, the, 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 those that have 10 cents, those that have 10 million. God is no respecter of persons. He set it up to where everybody can do their part and be just the same, no matter what we give. And it's just obedience. And there was a woman, there was a famine. She was a widow, she had a son, and they had used up everything in the house. And they had a little bit of cake, a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil. They were getting ready to, she was out gathering sticks to make the last cake before she was to die. And the prophet came to town. And some of us, sometimes we feel like that. But we feel like we are the last. But, but really, I don't think many Americans are, are there anymore, John. We feel like it, but we're not. Because most people I know that say they can't afford to is got a cell phone, it's got cable or satellite. Oh, God's, God's not as important as my cell phone and my cable and my satellite. Excuse me? Yes, he is. If I have to cut anything out of my budget, it's internet and cable will have to go before I'm going to try to cut my tithe out because internet and cable don't give me a blessing. It don't rebuke the devourer for me, but obeying God does. And people are under a curse because they're not obeying God and they can't afford to, but yet they're perishing because of that. And the woman said, man, the prophet came and said, bring me, do what you said, 
Bring me the first portion. Now, if that was today, the computer, the TV, and the, the news would be all over Billy Graham or T.D. Jakes or whoever. T.D. Jakes said, bring me the first portion to a woman who didn't have nothing but enough to live the last meal. Wouldn't you believe the news would be all over that? Oh, yeah, yeah. But if you give it a day or two, <laughs> hallelujah, it'll be all over the next portion, too, when God continues to expand the well, provision. Well, this is something I, want, I that I, I did say earlier, and I want to explain what I'm saying when I was talking about some of the TV evangelists. Um, I know for a fact, some that I know personally that I've sat under, that when you ask them to come and preach a meeting, they pay every expense themselves. They don't ask you for a dime. They just are grateful for the opportunity to preach. Um, and there are those who are put down continuously because of what they have. And the same God that cured me in the hospital has blessed them with something that they can show that, you know, God gave this to me so I can honor him and let you know what he's done. That's not being prideful. That's not being greedful. That's just being a growing Christian. And you know, I, I wanted to clear that up, and I was going to prior to this, that I wasn't talking about all of these. I'm talking about some of these very specific ministries that have been feeding the same little kids 50 years, same picture on TV, same fly walking around the kid's car. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the next kid never gets fed. And it, it, that bothers me. Because to me, that's a scam. But when somebody is doing something for God, honoring God with what God has given to them, um, you know, we talk about some of these pastors or some of these evangelists and the things that they have, and, and I, I disagree with one guy recently, and I said it here two weeks ago. But there are, are evangelists out there <coughs> with multi million dollar homes, multi million dollar airplanes, you know, super expensive automobiles, and a lot of people think, I don't think you ought to have that. Well, they wouldn't have it unless God let them have it. Secondly, how many airplanes, how many homes, how many cars did they give away that we don't hear anything about to get to the point they are? Again, they're not enabling somebody. They're seeing a need and filling it. Amen. Good discussion this morning. We, I didn't even plan on talking about time and giving today. Brother John's got a way of pulling that out of me, but I believe God's got us learning every once in a while on this because, you know, I think oftentimes we say, just like the other widow, you know, there was a widow, her husband died, and she felt like her sons were going to be taken and put into slavery to pay her bills. And she went to the prophet, and the prophet said, what do you have in your house? And what we need is not in somebody else's church, it's not in somebody else. What we need is here. What's if we would all do our part, just a small church we got, and, and, and 80 to 90% of our people are doing their part. Amen. But if everybody did their part, there would be an abundance even in the small church that we got because our budget is so small. So well, if God's not asking us. God's going to send more people. But first of all, he wants to know what do we have in the house because what we need is here. It's not out there. Hallelujah. As we get ready to take up our Sunday school offering, remember the Sunday school offering is used for benevolence. We've had a lot of situations going on with that to buy flowers for people that's passed away and different things for people in the hospital. And thank you so much for your giving. But this fund has completely been used for our benevolence fund and those in need. And we just we just bless God. Lord, we just thank you this morning as I lift up Amy and I's offering, Lord God. Lord, I just thank you, Lord God, that, Lord, that you provided for us to be able to give to the benevolence fund of our church, God, as we use our Sunday school fund for, for flowers and, and people in need, Lord God. Lord, we just pray that you bless this benevolence fund. Lord, we just thank you, God, that, Lord, that you have provided for us to be a blessing. God, we just thank you for your faithfulness, God, as we give this morning. 
We give as unto you. Thank you for Brother John. Thank you for his teaching, for God, and his diligence to, 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 to speak the word and to teach the word. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to take about a two-minute break, and then we're going to get back started with Brother Scott and some worship. Hallelujah. So if you need to use the restroom, stretch your legs.